Lord, you're perfect in your goodness. <laughs> and you're a good God. You've been good to us. Lord, we're so thankful for mercy, for grace, for help. Lord, we're so thankful Peter. Oh. Second Peter chapter 1. Last week, uh, Nikki talked about the righteousness, righteousness of God. A lot of the body of Christ, uh, I don't know, I, I believe we were taught, but sometimes when you don't, uh, when you let things go, you can, it can slip from you. And so the Bible says, continue in the things that you have heard. And so, Dr. Savell has been going back to teaching about the basics of Christianity, the basics of faith, uh, the basics of love, the basics of prosperity, the basics of healing. Because there's a lot of uh, new people that have come into the body of Christ that haven't heard some of these things. And so tonight, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about, you know, salvation life and some of the basic things of eternal life. Uh, this, I said it Sunday morning that this is a big deal. That you, have, that you have gone from death unto life. It's the greatest miracle that could ever happen uh, in this earth because you can die healthy and go to hell if you don't have Jesus. So whether somebody got their healing on this earth or not, but they got Jesus, they, they, they got everything. So 2 Peter chapter 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant apostle of Jesus Christ, Verse 1, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to, all, to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which... We have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, 
these promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. All right, let's first talk about righteousness. And I'm I'm just going to give you a quick, uh, Nikki didn't necessarily say these things, but just some bullet points of righteousness. From uh, Righteousness is, is right standing with God or the ability to stand in the Father's presence without guilt or condemnation or inferiority. That is right standing with God. That's what righteousness is. And so Peter's talking, he said uh, that, that like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God. And so when Jesus became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness, now we have right standing with God that we can stand in God's presence, not guilty, not condemned, and not with an inferiority complex. In fact, he says, uh, boldly come before the throne of grace to obtain mercy. So we can boldly come to God, not sheepishly, but boldly come to the throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy and to find help or grace in, in your time of need. So righteousness means that uh, you have the ability to stand in the presence of Satan and not be timid and not be fearful and not be inferior to him with this sense of inferiority. Because of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection, listen to what I'm going to say here, you are superior to Satan because of Jesus. So he's put all things under his feet. He's on the inside of you. He's given us authority to trample on serpents. He's given us authority to cast out devils. Come on. So we are not inferior to Satan. Now, he would like to make us think that we are or mess with our minds, that that our problems, our circumstances, things that are going on in the world, COVID-19, that all these things are bigger than us, but they are not. We have the authority and we have the superiority over him in Jesus' name. So you have a superiority complex towards Satan rather than an inferiority complex. Righteousness is that, listen to this, now this is key. It means that you have come to count on God's ability in you to live godly. That's what grace is. It's you have come to count on God's ability on the inside of you to live godly. It's God's grace working in you. Titus talks about that. God's grace working in you, enabling you or helping you to live godly. So we should live like Jesus has risen. We just talked about the resurrection on Sunday. Four of you got what I was saying. Y'all aren't going to do me like this tonight. You're you're, going to participate Or I'm going to preach back there and turn around. We're going to live like Jesus is risen. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he lives on the inside of us. That's how we're going to live. That's what righteousness is. And becoming the righteousness of God. So it goes on to say this verse. In verse 4 it says that... We, that we may, all these things, so that we may be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. The word partaker means sharer, a companion, and a partner. Nikki, come here, please. It means companion, partner, or sharer. My wife is a partaker. She's a partner. She's a companion. See, we are one flesh. 
But she shares in what I do, and I share in what she does. Sometimes I've made good decisions, and sometimes... <laughs> But, we, but she's a partaker either way, right? We are one flesh. She's my companion. So if I go over here, she goes with me. If I go over here, she goes with me. And so she's affected by what I do. She's a partaker. She's, she's in this. We're partners in this life together. And so... This scripture says that we are partakers of the divine nature. Now, what does that mean? Of the divine nature. Now, we have this newness of life being born again. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? So this divine nature, the word nature means an origin of something or what something's made of. That's what the word nature means. So when we talk about divine nature, it's, it's godly, it's, it's God's nature on the inside of us. That's what we're made of. So God has placed himself on the inside of us. Jesus lives on the inside of you and me. And so I'm a partaker of everything that pertains to life and godliness. So it, goes, so it says that in verse 3, that everything that pertains to life and godliness, he has given us. So everything that we need in this life is in the life of God. Where's this life of God? On the inside of us. The life of God will produce everything that we need to live victorious in this life. So so I'm a partaker in this life of God. I'm a partaker in this divine nature. I'm a sharer of this. I'm a partner. I'm a companion with God who's in me. His divine nature is in me, helping me to be and live godly. So when we speak of divine nature, we are speaking of something that manifests of the characteristics of God's nature. It's the characteristics of God's nature that's on the inside of me. What's what's some of the characteristics of God's nature? Shout them out. Some of the characteristics of God's nature. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All these things are characteristics of God's nature, and I'm a partaker of that. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read from the Amplified. And as you're turning there, I'm going to make this statement. In our righteousness, or in our right standing with God... And when I say in our righteousness, I mean that Jesus made us righteous. So in our righteousness through Jesus, we can now share in everything that God has and everything that God is. Because Jesus made us righteous, we can now share in everything that God has and everything that God is. So Ephesians 1 verse 18 says that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. The Amplified says it this way. I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened, flooded with the light by the Holy Spirit. And that's what this word is doing tonight. It's a a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The word is going forth right now to bring a light on this topic or on this subject for you so that you can have revelation of what's available to you and what God has done for you. So that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, 
the confident expectation. See, I can expect this. It's not something I have to sheepishly hope for. It's something that I can expect that the divine nature of God is on the inside of me and I'm a partaker in that. To which he called you. So we got to understand basically what this verse is saying is that your eyes are, the, the eyes of your spirit are open to who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, then there's an identity crisis and you don't know how to act. But if you know who you are and whose you are, then you can partake of the inheritance of whose you are. See, my son is part of who I am. And so I say, you're my son. You were born of your mother and your father, Eric and Nikki Deaton. And you're a partaker in what we have. In fact, we, we, never, uh, we never bought a new car. And we just, you know, we would find good deals. Uh, we, would, we had an opportunity to go to the car auction, which is, which is a lot of fun, and bid on cars. And so we got cars, you know, like that. But I always wanted to go to the car lot and purchase a car brand new off the lot. It's just, it was a desire that was in my heart. I know what they say, that once you drive it off the lot, you lost thousands of dollars. Didn't care. For me, it was just a goal that I had to get over a poverty mentality that I had that, that, that I thought that I couldn't go buy a brand new car off the car lot. So when the time came for our son to you know, become a senior, graduate high school. I wanted the first person in our family that to ever have a brand new car right off the car lot to be him. And so he got the very first brand new car in the Deaton family after we had been married, or he was 17 years old at the time. We had been married for 21 years. Never had a brand new car. But because me as a father... Love my son. I wanted him to have better than what I even had. I wanted him to have the best that, that I had to offer. Well, with God, there's no limits. Well, with God, there's no limitations. We serve an unlimited God. The best he has to offer is as big as you can think and exceedingly, abundantly, above all, you can ask or think. That's the best we have in God. How big can you think? What can you believe for? We got to get our dreams out, you know, Dr. Savell said, get the dream out of the closet. We get our dreams back, start dreaming again. You know, in this, in this time when we've been, the last couple of years, people have, have uh, the circumstances of life and the things that have gone on in the world have lulled people into a state of slumber where they don't, they don't dream anymore. They don't believe for things. But, hey, let me tell you, God's still giving people their best year ever. And you can have your best year ever. Maybe you've had it tough the last two to three years, but God can restore everything that you've lost, your health, your finances, your marriage, your children. He can do it all in a snap of a finger. That's the God we serve. You can be a partaker of that. It's available to you. Now, I can be a partaker of the divine nature of God, or I can be a partaker of what's flesh and blood. I have that choice. He says, choose life or choose death. Well, we know that everything that's, it, that's of flesh and blood will die. And so without the life of God... We can't put any, any eternal life on flesh and blood. So that means that when I receive eternal life, I'm eternally blessed. I'm eternally victorious. Do you realize that when Jesus defeated the devil, that it was for eternity? 
It wasn't for a moment. It wasn't for a season. It wasn't for months. It wasn't for years. It was for eternity. So when I get born again, that everlasting life, that eternal life doesn't start when I get to heaven. It begins the moment that I confess with my mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And this, and this transformation of my spirit going from death to life now happens. And so eternal life begins right there. And right there from that moment, no matter what I've come from, no matter what I've been through, I am now given sonship status. I am now in right standing with God, having received the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, what Jesus did for me. Somebody ought to shout about that. So he says, I pray that your, your eyes are opened to this, to the hope of your calling. You still are called, folks. You still have a calling. God's still got a plan. It's plans of good, not of evil. He's a good, good father. It's, it's plans to give you a future and a hope. I've preached this in prisons. We were in the prisons for 18 years in prison ministry. And I would tell those guys, yeah, saints, saints, not prisoners, you have a future and a hope. Saints, we have a future and a hope. You can partake of everything that pertains to life and godliness through God's divine nature. How do we do that? We receive it by faith. And corresponding words showing what we believe. So, if we go all the way back to the beginning of mankind... It says that in Genesis chapter 2, look at it so you can get your eyes on it. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The Amplified says, the breath or the spirit of life. So it's, so it's man was, God breathed into man his spirit. Now I heard Dr. Savell say this in an old uh, message they did, that he was repeating Brother Copeland. And what Brother Copeland says was that Adam was the first man that was born again, but not like how you and I are born again, because Adam had the life of God to begin with. But he went from life to death. So God, having created man and wanting fellowship with man, wanted to, man to experience the life, this divine nature, the life that God has for us, which, which the word that means zoe or the God kind of life or the way that God lives. The way that God lives. So he wanted this for mankind, but because of the way that the earth was set up, he had to operate under which the words that he spoke, his eternal words. So there had to be a sacrifice. And so it says that man, in, in chapter, uh, verse, chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Then, so Adam sinned, and it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened. So we just read in Ephesians chapter 1, I pray that your eyes are opened to the hope of your calling. Okay, Adam's eyes were opened now. He only knew good. He only knew good. He didn't know evil. But his eyes were open to evil. And now he knew both good and evil. And so, if we skip down a couple of chapters in uh, chapter 6... Now, this is the progression now 
of sinful man progressing in the world, then, verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Because man had gone from the life of God to from blessing to cursing. And so he needed sacrifice. And so we come to the central theme of the Bible, John 3.16, that we're all taught in Sunday school. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. The same life that God had breathed into man. God sent Jesus to give that same life back to man that man hadn't had. So, Jesus was born naturally into this earth. Someone asked Jesus, Nicodemus, Jesus said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, well, how can a man be born twice? Jesus said, you're, you're born of water, meaning you're born naturally, and then you're born of the Spirit. So you're, so you're born again or born twice, born of water naturally or born of the Spirit. If you're never born, you can't be born again. Is this pretty basic for you? So Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have what? And have it more. What's that life? The life of God. The, the breath of God. The life of God that he wanted back into man. His very life. His very nature. So that we could be partakers, partners, companions with God. So that we can experience the life that God has. Like God lives. We could be a walking, talking image. Remember, man was made in the image of God. Meaning we were a walking, talking replica of God. So God, what does he do? He brought the animals to man to see what he would call them. So if you don't like what the word giraffe, why giraffe, how do we get giraffe? You can talk to Adam about that when you get to heaven. Adam, how did you come up with giraffe? It's a, it's a little joke. Very little, I can tell. Moving on. So Jesus said, I've come back. I've come down here. God loved man so much that he sent Jesus. Jesus said, I've come to bring you back the life of God. Or the life as, as God lives it. So eternal life means... We have eternal victory. Now, when you understand this position, it changes things. When you understand that I'm not inferior to the enemy, I am superior to him. I'm not talking about some haughty, prideful thing. I'm talking about in God, because of what Jesus did, because of what he said, I am in him. That's the reason I can stand on these promises. So that means we have eternal victory in Satan. It means that Satan is eternally defeated. It means that we are eternally set free and Satan is eternally whipped and conquered. Come <laughs> on. 
So when the scripture says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, this isn't some cliche scripture that we quote because we're so spiritual. No, it's literally, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's what it literally means. <laughs> so Jesus came to restore this life to mankind, this dominion, this authority that God had given man to subdue, to have dominion, to rule, to have kingship, to have authority. And I'll tell you that uh, he had to pay quite a price to do that, did he not? He was beaten, bruised. You know, we just came from Easter Sunday. Beaten, bruised, bloodied, spit upon, made fun of, crown of thorns, nails and hands and feet. The Bible says he was marred beyond human recognition. I don't, I don't even know. People couldn't even watch the Passion of the Christ. They said it was too gory. But it says that when you, when someone, when you hear the, when the Bible says you're marred beyond human recognition, that's pretty nasty. He paid a heavy price for us. And then when he said those last words, it is finished. What is finished? He had taken on the sin of man. He became, he became sin. He became sin. So I don't know if cancer had, had gotten in his body, began to eat up his body. He became sin, anger, you know, all kinds of the nasty things. that He became sin so that we could have right standing with God, so that we could boldly approach the throne of grace, so that we could be sons and daughters of God. So that we could be divine partakers of everything that God has pertaining to our life and live the life that God lives. So he says it is finished. We don't know what happened. We, we you know, a lot of people can give a, a picture of what might have happened. But in the very depths of hell... When, when God <laughs> said, enough's enough, you know, this has been fulfilled, love has conquered, and the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me? The the death-conquering, life-giving power of God is in me, and I can partake of that? And he ascended to heaven. I want to read you what it says in Hebrews chapter 2 about this occurrence. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, and when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels... Did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Verse 8, but to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever. A scepter of what? Righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved what? Righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. So watch this. Jesus came out of the depths and the pit of hell.
having experienced whatever that was. And into the very throne room of God. And God says, today I've begotten you. You are my son. Think about that. Think about it. I don't know what hell you came out of. But it wasn't worse than what Jesus came out of. And yet to Jesus, he said, you're my son. And he's given us that same inheritance. We are joint heirs with Jesus. And he says to us, you are my son. See, that's one thing I can, as a partaker of God's divine nature, that I can partake of and realize that my standing with God is right standing as his son. I'm his son. He loves me. I'm his son. He loves me. And just like I want the best for my son, God wants the best for me and for you. And so, Colossians tells us that, that you who were dead in trespasses, that, that was us. We were dead in our trespasses before Jesus. He says, that you were in your flesh, your, your sensuality, your sinful carnal nature. I'm in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, reading from the Amplified. And it says, God brought to life together with Christ, having freely forgiven us of all transgressions, having canceled and blotted out and wiped away the handwriting of the note or the bond with its legal decrees and demands, which was in force, stood against us or hostile toward us. This note, with its regulations, decrees, and demands, he set aside and cleared completely out of our way by nailing it to the cross. So the debt we owed was nailed to the cross. God disarmed the principalities and powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them and in it, in, in the cross. So picture this. When the, when the Bible talks about making an open display of someone, it's talking about an army would go in and defeat another army, and then they would display them through the streets, having stripped them of their clothes, their armor, and everything that would make them a threat, sometimes even cutting off their thumbs so they couldn't hold their sword, parading them through the streets to say, these are the ones that are defeated, and we have victory over them. And that's the picture that God gives us of what he did when he stripped Satan of his authority that man had given Satan. See, God had given man this authority, and when man sinned, he turned this authority over to Satan. Now, when Jesus came into the depths of hell and God said, enough is enough, and the same spirit that now raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus stepped on the devil's neck. That's what I think happened. <laughs> Took him by the throat, you know, held him up, flung off all the demons of hell. They all trembled and, and, and then... And then he took those keys and ascended into heaven straight to God, straight to the throne where God says, now you are my son, I have begotten you. What are these keys? Jesus said it, you read it Sunday morning. In Revelation chapter 1, let me just read it to you, Don't uh, if I can find it. He said, I'll, I'll find it, i got to find it. Revelation 1 Verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Do you know what keys represent? Keys represent authority. 
When you give someone keys, you are saying they are in charge or they are in authority. And they have the authority to lock and unlock. They have the authority to open or close, to keep things in or to keep things out. So Jesus, when he descended back into earth to see his disciples, in Matthew 28, verse 18, he says, All authority or all the keys of heaven and earth have been given to me. Go, therefore. And he gave them authority to go and make disciples of the nations, to lay hands on the sick, to cast out devils. What does that mean? That we have the authority in this earth to operate in his name against the enemy that comes against us and the whole world. That we stand in authority with the keys. With the keys. We have the authority. We have the power. This changes our stance in this earth. Without God, I am nothing. Without God, my righteousness is as filthy rags. But with God, all things are possible if I can believe. So there's unlimited possibilities if I partake of the divine nature of which he's put on the inside of me through his life. I'm preaching better than you're saying tonight. <laughs> so let's end here. So in his divine nature, I am a son. I have authority. And he even says that in Mark chapter 16. You can look that up later. So in here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says, therefore, since these, his children in the Amplified, share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind, he himself, in a similar manner, also shared in the same physical nature, but without sin. So that, through experiencing death, he might make powerless or ineffective or impotent him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, that he might free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in slavery. So just a, just a chapter later, and we'll end here, Hebrews chapter 3, he says, Beware, brethren, lest any of you with an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we have become partakers, there's the word again, of Christ, if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Why did Jesus say, he who endures to the end will be saved? He who endures to the end will be saved. That means that the times of the end, and the Bible tells us that people depart from the faith, that they'll be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, unthankful, unholy, disobedient to parents. This is the time we live in, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And so every day I can choose to be a partaker in a whole different life that the world has no idea about, but we got to tell them. Because this life in God and in His life that He's called us to live and in Him, you can be a partaker of everything He has. You can be a partaker. Everything he is. 
in a world that's gone nuts. This world's gone crazy. But you stand as a son in authority to have dominion in your, in your world, in your circle. To have influence. To preach this gospel. This is good news. That you come out of the pit of hell. Out of darkness and into what? Light. His marvelous light. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. <laughs> Some of us are more peculiar than others. Would you stand? Lord, we thank you for this word tonight. Lord, we choose to be divine partakers, to share, Lord, in this life that, that you've, through what Jesus did, this eternal life. Thank you so much, Lord. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful he saved you? Oh, we're so thankful. <laughs> we're so thankful. Here in your presence. What do you need to partake of tonight? Do you need joy? There's joy. Just receive it. Do you need forgiveness? Receive forgiveness. Do you need healing in your body? Receive healing in your body. Do you need peace? Receive peace tonight. Lord, we're so thankful. In your presence. There is joy forevermore in your presence. There is peace. I receive it now. In your presence, there is healing. In your presence, my family is restored. In your presence, there is more and more. We love you, Lord. your presence those that have been battling mental attacks
receive the peace of God by the anointing of God. In Jesus' name, be the anointing of God. We break that off of you in Jesus' name. Songs of hope, songs of peace. Songs of deliverance. He's singing over you. <laughs> He's dancing over you. Heaven is behind you. You're not in this by yourself. The devil wants to isolate you. But that's why I've given you a family. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the body of Christ. It's the church family. For you to edify and exhort one another as the day approaches. Plug in. Plug in. Lord, we give you praise tonight. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the divine nature that we have. Mm. Thank you that we have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to fully grasp. All that you are in us, Father. We thank you for it. Hallelujah. Now, Eric ministered there at the end, and you said that words that encourage one another. So I encourage you to give somebody an encouraging word right now. Give them an encouraging word. Maybe it's on someone on the other side of the auditorium, but give an encouraging word. Hallelujah. You have the Spirit of God on the inside of you. The love of God is on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Maybe it's the exact word they need to hear tonight. Hallelujah. Coming from you. Hallelujah. Bible tells us to encourage one another. It says, let brotherly love continue. Let it be a fixed practice. Let brotherly love be a fixed practice. Amen. This is something that we do when we come to the house of God. We, we encourage one another. We build one another up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You can be seated. A great word. Give God praise for the word. Amen. Thank you, Eric, for taking the time to hear from God and ministering to us tonight. As you're preparing to give, I, I want to kind of key on the thought of divine nature. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, was one of my favorite stories in the book of Acts is when he confronts the, the educated of the educated on Mars Hill. And he even makes a reference, and I'm not going to read the whole or quote the whole thing here, but he does say, even as your poets have said that we are offspring of God. And then he says, and he goes on, he goes, therefore, since we are offspring of God, he's taken their own words. It's interesting how he's trying, Paul uses their own words and then turns around and ministers to them out of their own words. And he says, therefore, since we are offspring of God, I want to say it's around verse 27, 28, something like that. Therefore, since we are off, off, we're the offspring of God, we should not think that divine nature is likened to gold and silver or stone or any sort of art or, or any device that can be made by man. So you're saying, don't try to compare divine nature to anything in the natural. Why is he, why does the apostle Paul communicating this? He's communicating this because, because what is divine nature in its very essence, divine, divine is an interesting word because it's, it's a word that um, you, you can't explain anything, so we just call it divine. That's not really a definition. We just call it divine. That's, you know, that's like divine nature. We don't know. We don't really know what it is. We just say it's divine. We, it's, 
We, you know, we don't really know all that it is. You know, it's like the God kind of love. We don't know what it is. It's Zoe, but it's, it's just the God kind. It's all, so he says divine nature. What is so significant about divine nature that it's not compared to gold or silver or stone or things that people would carve and make idols? Because that's what Paul's re referring to. It's not life-giving. What's so important about understanding divine nature is divine nature is something that gives life. He's telling them, look, your gods that you worship, the gods that you serve, the things that you make, the things that you're running after, they don't, they aren't life-giving. So he tells us, we, because we're the offspring of God, we shouldn't think that our divine nature is like other things. So think about that as in your giving. I have divine nature, so therefore generosity flows out of me. I have divine nature, therefore love flows out of me. I have divine nature, so everywhere I go, I'm life-giving. I'm life-giving. I'm life-giving. Your tithes, your offering, it's life-giving. It causes the kingdom of God to expand. It causes the word to go into other places. It's life-giving. You, when you, when you uh, not, don't even consider like the church, if you, if you all of a sudden the Lord puts on your heart to sow finances into someone else's life, what happened? You just gave life to that person's situation. So nothing in this natural can ever, ever give life like divine nature can give life. Amen. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sow, to give, and I thank you that because we have divine nature, that means we have your nature, and your nature is one of generosity, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, you can receive the offering. Uh, while they're doing that, we have a couple announcements. Nikki, would you like to do the announcements, or do you want me to do them? You got it? You want me to do it? Who's on first and that's in second? Um, don't forget, this coming uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have Minister Billy Brim with us, and um, she's coming here specifically to talk about the end times. And um, it's something we're excited about, and so I encourage you to bring somebody with you. Uh, it'll be Friday night at 7 uh, p.m., Saturday evening at 6 uh, p.m., and then Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, on that Friday and Saturday, we do have uh, children's ministry from ages 0 to 5. Also, this is Thrive Group Weekend, uh, so it's our, uh, our, we do it once a month, so I encourage you on Sunday evening, get connected with the Thrive Group if you haven't already. Uh, maybe you went to one and you're like, well, I'm not sure if that was the right fit for me. We have, we have about uh, 10 different groups, so I encourage you, you can go online, the Church Center app, and you can get more information about that. If you are a Thrive Group leader, just lift your hand right where you are. Just look around, look at those hands. So if you need, if you need information um, or you want, want to check out a, a group, get connected with uh, those, those families. So that's a Sunday evening from 5.30 to 7.30. Um, you can, but you can drop your children off here. We have pretty much zero all the way up through um, high school age. Um, the, our youth has rec night. Uh, and then we also have things going on for our, our younger groups as well. And so you, children, you can be dropped off as early as five, but they have to be picked up by eight. Um, and then also this coming Sunday, we'll be starting a Mother's Day, uh, a fundraiser uh, for our youth going to camp. And there'll be, um, there'll be uh, fundraising tickets for a, a basket, a huge basket they're um, going to be giving away on Mother's Day. So I encourage you to support our youth and uh, all the things coming up. A lot of things that we'll be doing in May as well for uh, fundraising for our youth camps and those types of things. So other than that, stand to your feet. Did I forget anything? Annette, did I forget anything? Good. All right. So... We will see you Friday night, 7 o'clock. So other than that, go give him Jesus.